Hi, everyone. Welcome back for another Two Bottle Tasting here on Wine Spectator. Um, I'm Keith Goldston, the Corporate Master Sommelier for Landry's, and with me is a dear old friend, Travis Hinkle. Travis, how are you? I'm doing great, Keith, and I am so excited today to talk Tuscany. How about you? <laughs> Hell yes. Um, <laughs> I think we both have always had kind of a strong affection and love for the uh, wines of Tuscany, and particularly Chianti Classico, where we're going to spend some time today. And, you know, and just because, you know, you're on the move so much now, like, what's the official title for my advanced sommelier friend, Travis Hinkle, who is kind of the man behind all of the magic at Del Frisco's? But, uh, you know, wh wh where are you now? What's up? I am, uh, I, I'm joining you from Philadelphia today where I'm at our gorgeous uh, Double Eagle uh, Steakhouse here in Philadelphia. Um, I'm currently serving as the corporate beverage manager for, for Del Frisco's uh, as part of the Landry's team. So very excited to be, uh, to be working with a great set of wine directors and some really fantastic wine programs around the country too. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, when we were working together, it was one of those things that when we were putting together the Grand Award list for the Post Oak Hotel, it was just like, I, I knew we were going to work well together because we got to the Italy thing. And it was like, more Chianti, more Chianti, like, let's keep buying more Chianti. So what is it that kind of helped you fall in love with the region and the wines there? Oh my gosh, Keith, I could wax poetic for a long time. I absolutely love Chianti. Um, and Chianti for me is one of those regions where it's, it's, it's like a, uh, a desert island red wine in a lot of ways. It's, it's an area that is um, not enormous, but it's large enough and uh, has enough diversity to always be interesting. It's also one of those red wines that I think more than anything else, I put my nose in the glass and it makes me hungry. So there's wonderful nuance. Um, but it never takes itself too seriously, and it just marries so beautifully with food that, uh, for that reason, it's uh, it's it's always been one of my favorite wines. And even from, um, it's got a great range from the top to the bottom. So there are, of course, those superstar, expensive, rare examples, and those are wonderful. But there's also just absolutely delicious red wine that's at a very accessible price point, and then everything in between. And so for that reason, I think it's. Um, it's, it's a wine that, uh, that people should enjoy more often and for really any kind of occasion. Travis, I am so happy that you brought up the diversity because that's one of the things I love the most about Chianti's is, you know, when I'm going and looking at wine, just inherently, I think about with food or time of day. And I love that there are those lunch Chianti's and then there's the dinner Chianti's, you know, or the appetizer yep. or the entree. And there's just something about the reliability and consistency and then the just unbelievable value, because I find that no matter where you're at in that range, if it is that kind of just Chianti, Chianti Classico, every day, I don't care if I finish the whole bottle, though I usually do. Um, the price point there is, for what's in the bottle, is incredible. And then if you go all the way up to this, like this, particularly the new like Grand Selezione, which we'll talk about later and actually get to try, I mean, you can put those up against the best wines of the world, and they're a fraction of the price. I mean, it's just completely underrated. I still don't know how it seems kind of like an undiscovered wine region, but it's just, to me, fascinating. And um, I just love that we still have so much diversity to enjoy and taste. Yeah, well, and it's a wine that I, I think it, it, people think they know it well until they really dive in and, and just discover how, how deep the rabbit hole Go, uh, goes. I mean, for example, so Chianti itself, right? Chianti um, is a fairly large DOCG, so one of the top regions within Tuscany in Italy. But as you zoom in closer, you get into the original Chianti Classico uh, zone, uh, which itself is, a, is another DOCG within the larger Chianti region. And then if you start looking at, uh, at the history, there are select uh, kind of communes and municipalities within the, uh, the uh, Chianti Classico zone today that represent kind of a more historic home for what was considered the heart of Chianti. And we're really privileged today to taste one of these uh, from with uh, Castello di Diabola's uh, Rada in Chianti, uh, both Chianti Classico and their Gran Selezione, which we'll jump into. Yeah, and that for me was always kind of one of those like kind of hacks or cheat codes you could do as a consumer is when you're in Italy, whenever you see Classico, amend it to the name it usually is the heart of the area the region it's yep. like the oldest vineyards and it was just one of those things that if you're looking at something with it or without it spend the extra little bit of dollars to get the classico because it's usually 
over delivers you know, compared to the regular one. Um, but I think uh, since we are going to start diving into the wines and go a little bit more into the region, I guess just one last topic is what are your thoughts on Sangiovese? Because we can't really talk about the region without talking about this unbelievable grape. And uh, what are your thoughts? How, how would you, you know, sell us on Sangiovese? Sangiovese, again, is just one of these amazing grape varieties that, again, um, is it, the, the only way to describe it, it is the red grape uh, to make food friendly wines, I guess. And so Chianti Classico always made from a majority of Sangiovese. You do have some other grape varieties that can contribute really interesting things to the blend. But for your, the kind of most pure expression of, of Chianti, um, I'm looking for high proportions of Sangiovese. And for me, Sangiovese is, um, I don't know, it has this uh, wonderful elegance and a kind of rustic characteristic to it. So it's notes of sour cherry, wonderful savory notes of, um, of a sun-dried tomato and, uh, and herbs. Um, and it has this wonderful kind of structure to it. It's great mouth-watering acidity that makes it so good with food. And it really has a firm tannic backbone too um, that can make it wonderful for laying down in the cellar and enjoying over, over many years. So um, it's one of these just magical grape varieties that for me has a lot of distinct sort of flavors and gets everything right to being able to enjoy uh, young, like the ones we're enjoying today or over the long haul. Yeah. And, you know, I definitely concur with almost everything you just said there. Great way to describe it. But also too, I just, I love that it's got kind of the richness and boldness of Cabernet Sauvignon, but kind of that yep. sexy allure elegance that I associate with Pinot Noir. I mean, the flavor profile is totally different, but structurally it kind of fits between the two and it's just a really cool unique grape and there is and i'll i will go full on just all in there is no better place in the world to grow sangiovese than tuscany you know 100%. i've tried it in a lot of other places all over the world and there's just something about the right space and the terroir the weather whatever you want to call it the soils the gluster so whatever it is there's just something magical about Sangiovese and Tuscany, and it is a perfect pairing. So, you know, i just thrilled to have it and kind of like that desert island wine. If I had to pick maybe one grape, quite, quite possibly could be Sangiovese. So I, I know we've got a great guest with us today. So uh, do you, is, do you, is it time to bring in Francesco? Is there anything that you'd like to add before we get rolling into these wines? No, I, I, I think it's time. I'm really excited to learn from Francesco today. So uh, without uh, further ado, Francesco Zonin, thank you so much for joining us to talk about the beautiful wines of Castello di Abola. Thank you, Travis, and thank you, Kate. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been listening yeah. a lot, and I agree with uh, <laughs> everything you said so far, especially on uh, on San Giovese and how amazingly, basically, it grows in Tuscany and for some you know, unknown reason, it, 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 it's hard to, you know, make amazing wine outside of the region. So Francesco, I mean, your family has an amazing presence in Italy and have been doing it for, for centuries. Um, can you give us a kind of quick rundown of how we ended up with you and this, these amazing wines from Tuscany? Uh, we actually turned 200 years old uh, last year. I'm a seventh generation, and uh, we're actually going to celebrate more this year uh, for obvious reason. But, you know, I was born and raised in uh, the Venetian area, and then my family uh, bought different wineries throughout Italy with uh, seven now, and one in, uh, in, in Virginia called Barbus Vineyards, and then one in Chile lately. And Castello di Albo is not only the second property, uh, but we purchased in 1976, but it's also a, a piece of heart because I was five years old when we bought it. So I remember, you know, spending the summer and all the vacation and weekends there with my parents, um, you know, restructuring the castle and the whole uh, medieval village and especially replanting the, the vineyards with the new clones of San Giovese. Yeah, I mean, that's just insane. That is crazy. Um, but I also, you know, that to me is fascinating. And then I, I love to hear that, you know, you guys are replanting and keeping Sangiovese strong. And I think that Sangiovese 2000 project 
was spectacular because, you know, as I said earlier, I think Tuscany is the greatest place on the world to grow Sangiovese. And I'm happy to kind of see that renewed energy and belief in the grape because there for a moment, it looked like there was a lot of Cabernet getting planted. And there's some great Cabernet in Tuscany, don't get me wrong, but I'm happy to see Sangiovese coming back, staying there and actually even getting better, you know, and not to say you can't have some great Merlot, Cabernet Francs, but this is something unique and special. I'm happy that a lot of work has been done to save it and improve it. So uh, thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you, but you know, it all makes sense. The wine was you know, created uh, in the 15th century where you know you could blend Sangiovese and Canaiolo and two white grapes, actually Trebbiano and Malvasia. Then the, the formula changed in the late 90s where we uh, are not allowed to use white variety anymore, but the door was open to Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon then. You know, it's it's strange because when when this rule changed, that's also the moment where basically all the major producers decided to move into a 100% Sangiovese, basically, and and use the Cabernet Sauvignon for the what is called IGT or Super Tusk. So having two expression of a same terroir based on two different uh, uh, varieties, um, Sangiovese being, you know, a very interesting uh, variety and then you were talking about uga before and that's even more interesting because then the chianti classico appellation the the, the heart and most most historical uh, area of chianti it's it's been divided into 13 different uh, uh, sub appellation that express again different terroirs and and style within the same uh, appellation we are in the radden chianti um, with, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a full with uh, very good neighbors, uh, doing an <laughs> incredible job with, uh, with us. And it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. We're going to need, we're going to need another few years to see the first, uh, Gran Selezione, uh, Radden Chianti, but it's, it's going to be, uh, it's again, you know, it's a new start for, a, a, a six centuries old, uh, appellation. Well, one of the things that I, um, you know, appreciate uh, about this wine is, um, uh, well, you're located in Rada. So uh, as we were mentioning earlier, uh, there's the Chianti Classico zone, which is sort of the, the historic heartland of the Appalachian. But then within Chianti Classico, there are three of the sort of original communes that make up Chianti Classico, and Rada is one of them. Do you want to talk a little bit about Rada and Chianti specifically and how it's maybe a little different than, say, Gaiole or Castellina or some of the other areas within Chianti Classico? Sure. So um, Rada was actually because Chianti is also a, used to be a political region. Yep. So Rada and Chianti is where the, the, the treaty was was signed to create this uh, sub political region called Chianti. So as a, a Two different places in the history of, of Tuscany, one uh, political and one, but we love more uh, <laughs> related, to, related to wine. But I, right. I will, uh, Rada in Chianti is probably represents the highest uh, part uh, in terms of altitude of the whole uh, appellation. Um, and it goes from uh, 350 to up to 750 meters above the sea level. So it's basically the extreme to grow uh, Sangiovese. And that's probably why the style is a little bit more different and more uh, less powerful, let's put it in this way, compared to other Appalachian that are nearby. Uh, and when I say nearby, are really near because it's, you know, Panzano or Gaiole or Castellina, it's, it's a 15 minutes drive or 20 minutes drive. And if you take up the curves, it's, it's really a few <laughs> miles away. But the soil is a little bit poorer, it's deeper, and it's um, it's uh, and because of altitude, it's a little bit chiller, especially on top. So from a vegetation vegetational point of view, uh, we are always a week or two weeks later than the rest of the of the Appalachian. And so and it's interesting because. It's also, if you look into some DOCs in Italy or DOCG, it's that part of Chianti Classico of Rada is one of the, with the longest time of the 
vegetation process because we start in uh, April, usually end of March, April 1st, and it, it ends on uh, um, the beginning of, uh, of, of October. And that's when we harvest. And usually, Rada, we harvest a week again or 10 days later compared to, to our subpopulation. And then, you know, the higher you go, um, usually you gain a um, few more days because of the, of, um, of the altitude effect. Um, yeah, it's, oh, I'm sorry. I just, no, no. to me, I find this all fascinating, especially because I, I grew up, was born and raised in Napa. And the joke there is if you don't like the weather, just drive 10, 15 minutes. And it changes dramatically within 10 to 15 minutes. And I find that Tuscany is kind of very much the same. And now living in Texas, where there are times where you can drive for three, four hours and it's still the same hot, sticky weather. I, I just don't think people understand how dramatically different just a few miles or kilometers can make a few hundred feet of elevation and the fact that it's so compact. And I know as consumers, it might be a little overwhelming, all these new regions or subregions, but they really do matter. And, and there are very distinct differences. So I, I applaud that you guys are mapping them out even more, even though anyone who grew up there, you knew always that Rada was going to be a little bit more elegant and perfumed. So it's, it's fascinating. And the Chianti Classico, which is one of our two wines today, um, what can you tell us about just, you know, the straight Chianti Classico and how do you, how do you go about making this wine? Is it, do you kind of know what is going in or is, do you shoot for the Grand Selection first and then what's left ends up as Classico? So Castello di Albola is a property of 125 uh, hectares, of which 100 are planted on uh, Sangiovese and 25 on um, Cabernet Sauvignon for our Super Tuscan Acciaiolo. And then we have um, about 10 hectares of um, Chardonnay at 750 meters. That makes it the highest vineyard in the whole uh, area. But going back to the Sangiovese, we selected three different vineyards called Santa Caterina, is Solatio and Marangole, and those are a single vineyard to produce Gran Selezione. So that's dedicated to that. Solatio is not even an actor, and uh, Santa Caterina is a five actor um, vineyard as well as the Marangole. And then the rest of the property is um, selected for um, Chianti Classico and Chianti Classico Reserva. So Reserva doesn't have a specific vineyard, even though in the last 10, 15 years, we tend to use more or less the same vineyards, but it's a selection of the best uh, vineyard according to the single uh, vintage. And, um, and Chianti Classico is basically a blend that we do from the, the, the different vineyards from the, from the property. And it's because uh, the property is it, it stretches from the bottom of Radin Chianti up to the top of the hill of uh, Castello di Albo, which is 650 uh, meters. So Santa Catarina, for example, it's at 550, whereas the Solatio is 600, 620, and Marangole is 450. So as I said before, um, our approach is basically on Sangiovese, 100%. Um, as I said, we're a little bit late compared to the average of the region. So we keep uh, beginning, middle of October. Uh, it happened that we pick end of October, beginning of November, some, some years. And then uh, um, we do a sort of very long maceration lately. We started with a couple of weeks, uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago. And now it's uh, 25, 30, also up to 40 days. Um, we have more maceration and less uh, repumping. So we tend to not, not to touch the grapes uh, much and to leave it, uh, to leave it there. Um, one of the interesting things of Radin Chianti and Castello di Adolo in particular is the tannins. So um, we try to pick when the grape is very ripe and that allow us, because of the soil that is, is richer in, uh, in Galestra and Alberese compared to other areas, so it's very poor, but the tannins become very elegant, very silky, 
and almost sweet. On the other side, because of the, of the soil being very poor and the altitude, you get a lot of acidity. And that what makes the style of Rada a little bit unique because you have silky tannins and a lot of acidity. And when you put together, you get a very drinkable wine. Very drinkable doesn't mean simple. Drinkable means something that you can enjoy. And, and keep you were right when you say, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the most interesting wines for food because that's when you express the best of, of this wine. But the other interesting thing is I was in a two-star Michelin restaurant uh, five days ago and we popped a bottle of Chianti Classico Castago di Alboga 1987. And the wine was unbelievable because it, you know, from the <laughs> color, it looked like a 2007. So then all this acidity really helps uh, aging the wine for so long. Another reserve or a special selection was a plain Chianti Classico. On the other side, um, you know, because of this loaded up of sweet tannins, the wine is very enjoyable even, even uh, right now. And the other thing on, on, on Chianti Classico that we change a lot, we move a little bit the aging from a, a typical uh, 60 hectoliters um, oak cask um, into, let's say, a variety of different casks going from 64, 45, 34 hectoliters, and then we use uh, 500 liters of uh, tonneau. Now I'm sorry because I'm going through actors and and and, <laughs> and um, I'm not very good at doing the math uh, right now, but it's it's basically twice the size of an average uh, barrique from uh, from Bordeaux, just to give you an, uh, an idea. So uh, we use a you, you don't need to apologize. That's uh, right, you know uh, we we tried metric system a while ago, but you know the U.S. and Belize, we got to hold on. <laughs> it's fine. I digress. Maybe as someday we'll all be speaking. Each other, it's fine. Exactly. So um, we use that 10, 15 percent of the of the small wood on the Chianti Classico, whereas Canta, Santa Caterina we use up to 50 percent of of the smaller wood of the of the. Then the aging is very similar, about a year, and that's when the difference starts also for Santa Catarina, because after the bottling, then we leave the wine cork and a label for a week standing for the cork to adapt. And then we place it um, laying down for another year. And that's where the tannins really start to, to define themselves and to make it a very unique style. Yeah. And so for our, uh, for our, you know, our, our viewers, this Gran Selecione uh, designation, which they'll encounter on some bottles, it basically stipulates a little bit more Sangiovese at minimum, but also this is a wine that has been aged. And so for um, for people who love uh, Brunello de Montalcino, something like a Chianti Classico Gran Selecione will, uh, will often appeal to that same kind of palate. Would you agree? Absolutely. It's, um, you know, first of all, the rules are, are stricter. So yep. it doesn't apply to our uh, winery, to Castego di Alboa, because we don't source any grape outside of the property. So we are independent. But technically, Gran Selecione, you can only produce with grapes from your own property. So you cannot source anything mm -hmm. from outside. And then if you age the Chianti Classico for a year, then Gran Selecione, you would age for twice as much. So usually, even the yield per hectare, uh, so that by law, you're allowed to produce 7.5 tons per hectare in the Chianti Classico. In Castego di Alboral, our average is 6.5 because the, the soil is very poor and we try to concentrate uh, the, 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 the grapes. On uh, Santa Caterina or Solatio, we go as low as uh, 4 or 4.5 uh, tons per hectare. So that's when you get most of the concentration. So everything gets concentrated. Um, sugar, but even the tannins and, you know, the antochani, the colors and everything else. So it's it's a very similar in style, even though the body, the texture and the potential of the wine is is really different. And I would compare it more with uh, with Montalcino, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I have both of them poured side by side right here. And the Chianti Classico is 
absolutely delicious. And, you know, for me, it's just the lead note is just this really just beautiful, pure cherry. And then it gets on the palate and it's cherry once again. And then it gets a little kind of herbaceous in a good way. And it's just, it, it's really approachable and just crushable. Like I could drink a lot of it really fast. Um, and then I get to the Santa Cantarita and it's just so much more herbaceous and savory and just, and then you get it on the palate and it's just the umami kind of richness of it. Like it's got a lot of, a long story to tell and it's going to take a while to kind of open up and share that with you. It's kind of like when, you know, you sat down with like a, you know, one of your elders and they start to talk and you're like, okay, I'm going to pull up a chair because you've got some cool stories to tell. And I kind of feel like that with the Santa Cantarita, that is just, it's like, it's really good right now, but it is just beginning its life. And it's fascinating just seeing side by side how different they are. But I mean, they're both delicious, but two completely different styles. Yep. Absolutely. And then, you know, Santa Catarina is a 2015, so it was a very uh, interesting vintage for us, even more than 2016, because it was a little bit of a warmer vintage compared to the, 15, to the 16. But because of Castego di Albo and because of the altitude, we were a little bit chillier than the rest of the, of the area. So the 15 was really a, a benchmark vintage for, uh, for us. And then the other beautiful thing of Castello di Albo is, you know, if you if you manage to leave the wine in the glass for a while, then you know the wine itself is going to tell you uh, a, a long story because it, it keeps changing and evolving for hours. One of the things I love to do when I pop a bottle of, of Castello di Albo is, you know, keep it on the table, and that would become my dessert wine or my my conversational wine because you know you leave it there and you taste it every five or ten minutes and it's like you know tasting three four uh, different wines but it that's the beauty of you know of Tuscany it's like you know uh, reading a, a long story that started centuries ago and then you know you, you discover it a little bit of a time on in the uh, in the glass and the only thing I'm sorry about but probably and hopefully technology will help is I would love for you and and you know and 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 consumer to take a look at Castello di Alba because then probably we do we did a lot of talking, but the <laughs> you know, once you realize where Castello di Alba is, you know this beautiful medieval village overlooking the whole Chianti Classico area because we have Monte San Michele in our back, which is the highest mountain in the Chianti Classico, and then you know you have. Castello di Albola, so you overlook the whole Chianti Classico area all the way up to Siena. So it's uh, in a beautiful day. Then you understand why why I feel so lucky every day I go there. And, <laughs> you know, we try to put a little bit of that piece of paradise in the, in the bottle. Well, it's such a magical part of the world, and I've been fortunate to to go through uh, a couple of times. And and every uh, every time I wonder why. Uh, why I don't uproot and, and, and try to move in, but there's something just so special. And every time I pour myself a glass of Chianti, it just smell, takes you back to that place and it just smells like Italy to me. And of course, Italy is so diverse and that's a different story. But for me, uh, Tuscany kind of epitomizes uh, the height of uh, at least red Italian wine. And so um, uh, it, it's been a pleasure to taste these today as well. It's my pleasure. Yeah. I, yeah, I, mean, it, I just completely echo what Travis said. It is one of those just magical places and being able to kind of take some of that energy and have it go into the soil, into the vines, be kind of look at that through the lens of San Giovese. It's, that to me is part of what makes wine so magical, this ability to transport you to a place. And I, I love that both of these wines absolutely do that. Um, and even particularly to like your little small little part of Chianti Classico and Rada, that it takes you there. And thank you for keeping those traditions and focusing, the, making it more refined and sharing it with all of us because these are beautiful wines and 
you know, whether you want one to enjoy right now or possibly a long time, as it sounds like the Chianti Classico will age quite well also, you know, or if you want something truly special that, you know, I think, in my opinion, I'd rather drink this than 99% of most of the Brunello de Montalcinos and will probably be a little bit more affordable than a lot of the Brunello de Montalcinos. And it's just not as hot. It's, there's elegance, there's, it's, I'm sorry, I'm going on a, going on a rant. I'm going to stop myself. But uh, these wines are amazing. So, Francesco, thank you for sharing them with us. And, um, you know, I look forward to maybe someday tasting with you there in Chianti or, you know, maybe we meet in the middle and we go to Barbersville and uh, drink some of the delicious Vermentino there or the Nebbiolo there in uh, Virginia. Because, you know, that's maybe a little bit easier is just meet in the middle. Absolutely. We, we actually planted some Sangiovese in Barbersville as well. But, you know, we managed, because the winemaker is from Malange, from Alba, uh, Luca, so we managed to produce a, a very interesting Nebbiolo, but Sangiovese, even for an Italian outside of Tuscany, is a big challenge. Very big. I imagine. Uh, yeah. But it makes all sense. So thank you, Keith, for everything. I love to, you know, meet in Italy or Barbersville and, and Trevis. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, our pleasure. Francesco, uh, Francesco, thank you so much. Uh, cheers to you. Yeah, beautiful. cheers. Wine. Thank you. Yeah. To Albol and to Sangiovese.